Double jeopardy is the prosecution or punishment of a person twice for the same offence. On December 13th, 2010, Mark Weston became the first person to be retried and found guilty of murder by a jury. But have you ever been told the story of Gary Allen? Allen is a convicted double murderer who killed Samantha Class in 1997, but was acquitted of her murder in 2000. He attacked more women over the next two decades before killing again in 2018. Keep watching to hear the terrifying story of a British psychopath whose bizarre hatred of female sex workers led to him being found guilty of two counts of murder. You are now listening to British Brothers, the True Cry podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the 8th episode of Season 6. Let me quickly advise you that this podcast contains elements that may be alarming to some listeners. As always, listener discretion is advised. I'm going to change things up a bit this week. Normally I'd introduce to you the show's villain at this point. But instead, I'm going to introduce you to a 29-year-old mother of three named Samantha Class. Let me set the scene for you. The year is 1997. The UK is two decades removed from losing the Cod Wars, a dispute with Iceland over fishing rights in the North Atlantic. Being a large fishing port, Kingston-upon-Hull's economy was greatly affected, and a period of high unemployment followed. Without turning this into a history podcast, One thing led to another, and Hull became known as the UK's drug-injecting capital. I appreciate that as a bit of a jump from losing the rights to fish for cod to being an injecting hub for Britain. In 1985, when Samantha was 17 years old, she became a sex worker. A common thing I found when researching Hull's past was that such a vocation was common during the 80s and 90s due to the city's economic decline. Perhaps more worryingly, Most of the city's sex workers used their money to purchase heroin. The reports I used to research this case suggested that Samantha, like many of her friends in the industry, was addicted to heroin and a sex work was a way to fund the said habit. Samantha did have an ulterior motive too. She wanted to take her three kids on holiday. With no father in the picture, as far as I can make out, she was struggling big time. By October 1997, Samantha's three kids, I'm not going to name them, were aged 12, 4 and 1. They lived at Firethorn Close, a cul-de-sac just off Walker Street in Hull, a stone's throw away from the Humber. The first timeline of this case begins on Saturday, October 25th, 1997. Leaving her kids in the care of someone she undoubtedly trusted, Samantha went out to work that evening. At or around midnight, Samantha was approached by a man in his early to mid-twenties who propositioned her for sex. Samantha got in the young man's car and they drove to a more secluded spot. Reports suggest they parked up at the Boulevard Unit Factory Estate. The mother of three was never seen alive again. A mere ten hours after getting into the strange man's car, Samantha Class's body was spotted by three schoolgirls walking along the banks of the Humber in the neighbouring village of North Ferribay. She was partially submerged in the thick mud and was only partly dressed. Her shoe, her underwear and her tights were all missing. The girls phoned the police, who arrived at the scene promptly to seal it off. The crime scene was examined and Samantha's body was taken away to be subjected to a post-mortem. A Humberside police spokesperson said, She was naked from the waist down, which does give rise to a sexual motive for the killing. However, the results of forensic tests are still awaited. The results of the post-mortem showed that Samantha had a total of 33 separate external injuries, with a cause of death being strangulation with the use of a ligature. Samantha also had internal bleeding and a damaged heart, spleen, liver, adrenal gland and kidneys. The post-mortem also confirmed that after being murdered, Samantha's body was intentionally run over by her attacker's car. It was clear that Samantha and her attacker had had sex before or perhaps during the attack, but it's not clear whether this was consensual, relating to sex work, or was a sexual assault. Samantha's missing clothes were found downstream a few days later. They were covered in blood, which explains why her attacker had removed and attempted to dispose of them. 
It's unknown how Samantha's body was moved from the factory estate to the Humber, but one can assume she was transported in her attacker's car. The pathologist who conducted the post-mortem of Samantha Class said the following of their findings. This female had been subjected to an assault, which included severe blunt force trauma in the form of stamping to the head, neck, chest and upper abdominal areas, followed by ligature strangulation, and finally she was run over by a vehicle before the attempt to dispose of the body by putting it into the River Humber. A high vaginal DNA swab, or HVS, was taken from Samantha's body and stored on file. It was run against the, at the time, recently established UK National DNA database, but no matches were made. Samantha's killer had not been in trouble with the police before, so his DNA was not on file. On Tuesday, October 28th, 1997, Humberside Police issued a picture of Samantha and publicly identified her as the victim. Seven months went by with no new leads. Samantha's murder remained a cold case, and her killer was walking the streets, ready to pounce again if he hadn't already. Humberside Police urged any and all men who had used the city's red light districts, specifically the Iceland Road, St Luke Street or Midland Street areas, to come forward and subject themselves to a DNA swab. It's thought over a thousand men were expected to be swabbed. In late May 1998, as those tests were being conducted, another death rocked the headlines of the local papers. 20-year-old Haley Morgan, who also went by Haley Marshall, came from a strong family background, but she left home at 14. The rest of her teenage years were spent in care homes, and she inevitably became dependent on drugs, heroin in particular. Like Samantha, Haley was a sex worker in Hull, and her body was found in a secluded alleyway on Friday, May 29th, 1998. She was reported missing two days earlier on Wednesday, May 27th, 1998. Again, like Samantha, Haley had some items of clothing missing, including knee-high boots and a jacket. As you can imagine, rumours began circulating about a serial killer lurking the streets of Hull, a la Jack the Ripper, or more recently and locally, the Yorkshire Ripper. Commenting on the similarities of the two deaths, lead investigator Detective Superintendent Quinton Dow said, We are comparing similarities. But at this stage, there's nothing concrete to link the crimes other than the fact that the victims were both prostitutes. There's no indication that Haley was subjected to a sex assault. Prostitutes are in a dangerous occupation. They work in hours of darkness with lots of strange characters about it. Does anyone else hate that word, by the way? Prostitute. So outdated, isn't it? It's one thing that annoys me about using old newspapers to research cases such as this. The language used is it, just so derogatory. It implicates the victims as being the ones responsible for their own demise. It just doesn't sit right. Initially, Haley was suspected of being murdered, but police would later confirm that her death was not being treated as such. Rather, it was being treated as the result of a heroin overdose. She was found with a plastic bag covering her head, though, which makes one wonder if that was indeed the case. Two months later, on July 30th, 1998, the partial remains of a third female body were found. The initial discovery of a right arm at Great Culvert Pumping Station led to a search of the surrounding areas. Soon, two arms and a badly decomposed head were found nearby. It was later confirmed that the remains all belonged to 25-year-old Natalie Club. The rest of Natalie's body was never found. The discovery of Natalie's remains only fueled the fire further as to whether there was a serial killer loose in Hull. When asked what his opinion was, head of Humberside Police, DCS Peter Wilshaw, said, at this stage, there is no evidence whatsoever to link the deaths of Samantha Class, Haley Morgan, and Natalie Club. And in fact, there are significant dissimilarities in the way they died and how and where the bodies were found. At this time, we have no evidence to suggest that all three victims met their deaths at the hands of the same offender or offenders. Friends slash colleagues of the three victims thought otherwise. We have no faith in the police, one 25-year-old sex worker said. There's a serial killer out there another ripper. Every girl I speak to is terrified they will be next. We all think just one man is to blame for Natalie, Samantha and Haley. I just can't explain why. It's just a gut feeling. A 24-year-old sex worker said, It's not really stopping us working. Some girls are staying indoors, but users like me need to work to pay for our habits. One of Natalie's friends named Tracy said, It's too big a coincidence to have three different guys to strike at three different times. 
Fred West didn't always kill the same way, and neither did the Ripper. I assume she means the Yorkshire Ripper at the end there, as opposed to Jack. There's plenty of studies available to read online that discuss the link between sex workers and drug use, by the way. It's incredibly concerning to read about how common it is in something called the work, score, use cycle. So they work to earn money. With that money, they score the drugs and then they use the drugs. Then they go back to work and the cycle repeats. I realise this has been a bit of a tangent, but I deemed it important to let you know about what life was like for sex workers in Hull back in the 1990s. Bringing it back to our timeline, we remain in July 1998. An intoxicated man was driving his car erratically and was pulled over by the police before he could harm anyone. He was clearly drunk, as confirmed by his failed breathalyzer test, and he was arrested for drink driving. As is now the protocol, a sample of the man's DNA was taken and placed on the UK National DNA Database. That man, dear listener, was this week's villain, Gary Arthur Allen. Gary was born on September 27th, 1973, and lived on Coltman Street at the time of his arrest, half a mile away from Firethorn Close. We often mention the nature versus nurture debate here on British Murders, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on which camp Gary Allen falls into after I've told you about his background. At the age of eight, Gary was first referred to a psychiatrist on account of his violent and frequent temper tantrums. With two younger siblings, a boy and a girl, Gary would spend his childhood tormenting them physically, mentally and emotionally. One source even suggests that Gary had a habit of starting fires, but whether that was limited to merely threatening his siblings with a lighter rather than actual arson is not known. He apparently spent a couple of periods at a place called Bernard House in Hull between the ages of 8 and 9. I struggle to find out what that institution was. I don't think it would have been a borstal because that was just after Borstals were basically outlawed in 1982. If anyone knows, please get in touch. Might have been a care home or something. Mentally, Gary was thought to have a split personality disorder. He would regularly attack the other children at Bernard House before calming down immediately afterwards. Other examples of the scary behaviour he exhibited during his teenage years are as follows. He attacked his mum with a metal clothes prop. It's one of those poles you use to prop up a washing line. He throttled a girl and struck her repeatedly in the head while she lay defenceless on the ground. Somehow she survived the onslaught. He assaulted the son of his foster carer at the time by attempting to strangle the 15-year-old. Things didn't change when he reached adulthood. Now in the army, a 19-year-old Gary Allen was reprimanded for criminal damage and theft while stationed in Germany. At the age of 21, Gary unleashed his inner rock star when he launched a telly out of a window when he heard that the UK didn't win the Eurovision Song Contest. That was followed by Gary threatening one of his housemates with a knife. You can see a theme developing here. Gary was a wrong un from day dot, and continued his violent antisocial behaviour throughout his life. Sadly, it culminated in the brutal murder of two innocent women. By November 1998, Gary Allen's DNA was ran on the system and matched the DNA sample taken from Samantha Class's body. He was formally charged with her murder on Tuesday, November 17th, 1998. The trial took place in early 2000 at Sheffield Crown Court, and somehow he was acquitted of Samantha Class's murder. The trial lasted seven weeks, and the jury only required a few hours worth of deliberation before finding him not guilty. The interesting thing about that is that Gary decided to take his car to a junkyard and get it scrapped on Monday, October 27th, 1997, a day after Samantha's body was found. He said he did it because he was frightened about being linked with the woman he saw on the news as he had been with her over the weekend. That's a big hole in the story though. Police didn't release the photo of Samantha to the public until the Tuesday, the day after Gary scrapped his car. So how did he know who the police had found? Because he'd killed her, that's why. That's the only way he could have known. Regardless, the now free Gary Allen moved 350 miles southwest of Hull to Plymouth, another port city located on the south coast of Devon. He lived on Wyndham Lane near Victoria Park. Once there, he wasted no time in committing more heinous crimes against female sex workers. In March 2000, a mere six weeks after being acquitted of Samantha Class's murder, Gary Allen approached the first of his two Plymouth victims and asked her for sex before grabbing her by the neck and attempting to assault her sexually. I'm unsure as to whether he was successful in that latter regard, but he was disturbed by a third party during the attack 
and swiftly left the scene. He tried his luck again in April 2000, using the same MO, but was once again interrupted. Both women reported Gary's attacks and he was soon arrested and charged with assault causing actual bodily harm and indecent assault. In December 2000 he was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to serve 5 years and 6 months in prison. On top of that he was handed an extended license period of 4 years and 6 months. Gary spent the next 10 years in prison and it was during that time that he revealed some of his darkest secrets to probation officers. He made his true feelings about female sex workers known. He referred to them as scum and the lowest of the low. His admissions didn't stop at name calling though. That was an unintentional rhyme. Gary explained to probation officers how he had always dreamed of violently assaulting a sex worker. He fantasized about doing so daily. When asked why he had attacked the two sex workers in Plymouth, Gary said, I like to frighten them. I like to cause pain. I like to make them cry. I like blood. I like to hurt them. I enjoy it. It makes me feel good. Genuinely not trying to be a poet here. That's a quote from Gary Allen. He went on to say, Prostitutes are easy targets. I just want to hurt people. Can't tell you how far. You know I can't tell you what I want to do to them. I enjoy thinking about it. I get pleasure from the thinking. But I just really enjoy different types of violence. Gary was briefly released on parole in 2003, but quickly recalled after breaching his conditions. I believe he was recalled to prison for breaching a sexual offences prevention order, two convictions of battery, and an offence of possession of an offensive weapon. Fast forward to 2010, and Gary Allen was released from prison once more. In April of that year, he moved to the port town of Grimsby. This man doesn't half love living by the seaside which is located around 35 miles south of Hull on the other side of the Humber. Still believing he was responsible for Samantha Class's murder and goodness knows what else, an undercover operation called Operation Mystic was authorised on June 16, 2010, with undercover operatives first being deployed three days later on June 19, 2010. The plan was to get close to Gary and attempt to have him spill his secrets to the undercover operatives who would be recording their conversations covertly. I urge you to listen to my guest episode with Shea Doyle that first aired on March 3rd, 2022. Shea was a level 1 undercover operative, and that episode will give you a better insight into what the role of the operative sent to befriend Gary Allen consisted of. Shea may have been one of the undercover operatives for all I know. Throughout 2010 and 2011, two undercover operatives posed as criminals using the fake names of Ian and Scott. Scott's backstory was that he had been convicted of domestic violence offences, whereas Ian was playing the part of a violent criminal. To encourage some kind of a confession out of Gary, the two operatives, along with other operatives posing as their girlfriends, used what was later referred to in court as theatre. Essentially, they would brag about their fictional criminal exploits. On one occasion, Scott and Gary picked up Ian from Hull Ferry Terminal, with the implication being that Ian had just returned from Amsterdam. Ian was carrying a bag of clothes covered in blood, said to be that of one of his enemies, whom he'd had to put in his place. Eventually, after amassing 400 hours worth of audio recordings, the undercover operatives got what they were looking for, Gary Allen seemingly admitting to murdering Samantha Class in 1997. Have a listen to this. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Well, you're probably not going to want to know me afterwards, but you want to know, I'll tell you. The truth of the matter is, is that, you know, years ago when I was depressed and I had sent to prostitutes about four or five times in a few years because of the depression and stuff. And I had sex with this prostitute one night and the condom spread. And she said, blah, 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 if you don't, I want your name and I want your address, and your money and everything else. I'm going to tell the police you raped me. So I strangled her and I dumped her in the umbrella. Serious. Yeah. Anyway, the police had DNA in that, but I went on the database. The reason I went on the database is because I'm never in any trouble. You know, I've not led a criminal lifestyle and that. So, anyway, I got done for drink driving and the DNA that way, and they arrested me and that. And I went to court and everything. And I just said, listen, yeah, I had sex with her last night in the, in the condom bus, but I was it. As far as I'm concerned, she went on her way and I went on my way. Of course, I'm going to tell the truth. No, I'm serious, man. I went to Sheffield Crown Court. I got found not guilty. And I had a mate living in Plymouth. 
And then the police were not desperate to get evidence. And basically we're interviewing everybody I'd known, even people I'd spoken to and stuff like that, because he had nothing on me. All it was was the fact that I had sex with her. Was... Well, no, because I mean, that thing with that Samantha class, as I said, I told you about that, what happened there. The condom split, and she said, well, if you don't give me this, that, and the other, and you don't start giving me money, and that, I'm going to tell the police you raped me, and I just flipped and I killed her, and dumped her. But that's just the way I was then, you know what I mean? So... I appreciate the quality of the audio recording isn't the best, but to summarise, Gary said he used sex workers on a few occasions when he was struggling with his mental health. He said he met Samantha Class, had sex with her, but then the condom split. When Samantha asked for his details and he refused, she said she was going to report him to the police and accuse him of rape. As a result, Gary killed her. That, of course, is only Gary's side of the story. Regrettably, it's the only one we have. The crucial aspect of that confession is that it was not prompted or goaded by the undercover operatives. Gary seemingly wanted to get it off his chest and offered the information voluntarily. Despite the confession, Gary wasn't immediately arrested. It seems the police wanted more evidence before requesting to overturn his acquittal from 2000. If we skip ahead a few years in our timeline to 2018, an ever transient Gary Allen was now living in a flat at Bradbury's Close in the market town of Rotherham in South Yorkshire, finally got away from the seaside. In October of that year, the then 45-year-old Gary met a 38-year-old Slovakian woman named Alina Grilakova. The mother of four had moved to the UK from her home nation in 2008 with her husband, but the couple had become estranged since then. Alena met Gary at a bus stop and got chatting. The pair reportedly often met at Gary's flat and, on occasion, had sex. In return, Gary gave Elena cigarettes, money and alcohol. He groomed her. As had the other women unfortunate enough to come across Gary Allen in their lives, Alina was going through an incredibly tough time when they met. She had become dependent on drugs and alcohol and resorted to sex work to earn money to pay for her addictions. On December 26, 2018, Boxing Day, the last time Alina Grilakova was seen alive was between 8.30 and 10.30pm. Considering that time of year, Alina's outfit choice was something police would let her hope to work in their favour as far as witnesses were concerned. She was wearing flip-flops, which is a bold move considering it was roughly 8 degrees Celsius in Rotherham at the time. Alina was also wearing a black top with white writing on the top and black bottoms with white stripes down the side. Her body was found four months later on either April 8th or 9th 2019 in a dry stream at the rear of the Fitzwilliam Arms Hotel in Parkgate, Rotherham. Her concealed body was naked and badly decomposed. An initial post-mortem led to inconclusive results, but further tests provided the cause of death. Elena's neck had been compressed due to being strangled, just like Samantha Klass. Specially trained officers were sent out to Slovakia to support Alina's family, whilst also supporting her UK-based family. Within two days of finding Alina's body, South Yorkshire police announced they had arrested a local 45-year-old man on suspicion of her murder. That man was Gary Allen. Police had traced Alina's movements using local CCTV cameras, 6,000 plus hours worth in total. At 7pm on Boxing Day 2018, Alina was spotted leaving the Travellers, a public house on Broad Street just up the road from the Fitzwilliam Arms Hotel. She was later seen around 10.30pm heading up Broad Street towards Bradbury's Close, the home of Gary Allen. After his arrest, Gary's mobile phone was looked at, as was his computer. He made a couple of voice recordings on his phone for some bizarre reason, which showed Alina turning up at his flat just after 5.45pm on Boxing Day, with her being kicked out around 20 minutes later. I've decided not to include the audio recordings here, they are rather disturbing, but South Yorkshire Police have released the audio on YouTube after first discussing doing so with Alina's family. To summarise, Alina appeared to have turned up at Gary's flat unannounced, and he says at one point, Alina, if you knock on my door again, I'm going to beat the fucking living shit out of you. I'm not fucking kidding. One source said that Gary's phone records showed he and Alina were close acquaintances, whilst also stating that he was arrested in January 2019 on suspicion of breaking a sexual offences prevention order. That order prohibited him from having contact with sex workers, but I don't believe he was in prison when he was arrested for Elena's murder. 
The searches of Gary's computer brought further evidence to suggest he was her killer. He'd done several online searches for tools used to dig holes. That was followed by purchases of a trowel and disposable gloves. Gary also regularly searched Elena's name in a search engine to see if her body had been found or if news of her death had been reported. His phone also reportedly contained images of dead female sex workers who had been strangled. With more than enough evidence to suggest Gary Allen had killed Alina, he was remanded in prison to await his trial. In the meantime, all the evidence from Operation Misty was brought forward along with new evidence personally presented to the appeal court judges by Director of Public Prosecutions, Max Hill QC. The new evidence included the charge of murdering Alina, which led to the Court of Appeal overturning Gary's acquittal in 2000 regarding the murder of Samantha Class. In April 2021, Gary's trial finally started after inevitable COVID-19 delays. He was to be tried for the murders of both Samantha Klass and Alina Grilakova. Despite all the evidence against him, Gary continued to deny both murders and pleaded not guilty to all charges. The trial lasted eight weeks and culminated on Thursday, June 17th, 2021 at Sheffield Crown Court. The jury found him guilty of both murders. On Wednesday, June 23rd, 2021, Judge Mr. Justice Goose sentenced Gary Allen to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 37 years, minus the 624 days already spent on remand. He said, It would not be an overstatement to say that what you did to those two women and the loss and suffering to their families was wicked. I doubt it will ever be safe to release you into the community. In April 2022, Gary lost an appeal against his convictions. Court of Appeal Judge Lord Justice Holroyd noted how Judge Goose's observation was neither inappropriate nor unfair and he had considered aggravating factors in the case. And that was the story of British murderer Gary Allen. Let me know your thoughts about it in the YouTube comments or on social media. Right, that's it for now. I can turn off the old iPad. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.